for those who don't know, who are you and what do you do? Um, my name is David Gerbstadt. I live in Berwyn, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a full-time artist now since my accident. Um, I mainly do um, sculptures, paintings, um, and lately um, kinetic sculpture. Um, I use primarily found and recycled materials, um, and I've been showing worldwide since 1993. Yeah. And what exactly is kinetic sculpture? Um, kinetic sculpture is like the example up on the wall. Um, there is a glass ball um, that um, they're handmade, and they go through a track. Um, this track in particular is made out of wood and some metal, and um, it goes through the track and it runs around and it starts at one point and it ends up at the other at the end point. So that's primarily what kin the kinetic sculpture is now. They're called rolling ball sculptures. That looks really interesting. Yeah, they're neat. Can I see the balls rolling? Sure. So these balls are glass, and I got them at Cape May. Well, it's their last. So they start at the top, close down, and then go around, go down, and then the second part is up here. Down. And That's so interesting. This piece will be one of six that will be in the Art Ability Show at the Bryn Mawr Rehab Hospital. And it's the largest disabled artist show in the U.S. Wow. Um, prior years, I've gotten first place for sculpture. Um, and, of course, since my accident, I'm qualified to be um, in the show. It's a worldwide juried show. Um, artists from all over the world, India and all over Europe, um, enter. And um, there's about a thousand um, pieces in the show. Wow. Yeah, there's over... And you've won it in the past. Um, yeah, two years ago, I won first place for uh, sculpture. Last year, I won... Um, I think it was the last year I won a... Uh, um, another um, piece was a, a Sudoku puzzle um, that was a collage piece. Um, and um, that was basically... Um, doing the puzzle and then I color in each square a different color each number and then I paste um, probably 10 to 12 puzzles on a big piece of wood um, what made that one unique was um, one of my disabilities that I was born with is a learning disability and so um, the title of the piece is overcoming can't um, Prior to that, I didn't was not able to do the puzzle, but a friend of mine um, showed me a few things, and after a while, I learned how to do the puzzles. So it um, was overcoming an obstacle, which is common in um, having disabilities. Wow. So, yeah. So um, can you tell kind of the story of your accident? Um, I worked as a pharmacy tech and um, come early December, uh, my boss told me that I hadn't taken my vacation all year and that I needed to take it or lose it. Um, it being in the retail uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, drugstore, um, it was our busy season and I hesitated and she said, just go. And so I flew to Sarasota, Florida um, to meet up with my sister who lived there, who was a doctor, uh, an anesthesiologist, Dr. Christine Gerbstadt, and um, our whole fa our the remaining family members were supposed to meet there in Sarasota for Christmas, and um, I had five days off, and um, we had Christmas holiday. It was okay. Um, on two days before I was supposed to fly home on December twenty eighth. Um, it was a nice day, so I went out for a bicycle ride. Um, nobody was at the house, and I came back for lunch. And um, she lived about 15, 20 minutes away from downtown. And um, 
the doors, the wall, everything was locked at the house. And um, I wasn't able to get in. And so um, I either wait, I would either wait for somebody to show up or ride back in town and have some lunch at a restaurant. I decided to get back on my on the bicycle, my sister's bicycle, and I was riding back to town. And um, within a few minutes, um, um, my my sister's um, friend rode by, who was driving his butt, uh, boat back to to the lot, and he was going to go back to the house. So I waved to him. And that was probably one of the last um, memories I have that were actually of, uh, you know, um, I guess uh, that was very clear. Um, A few minutes later, I was riding down the sidewalk um, and I came in contact with a 14 wheeler truck that was making a right turn on a, on um, a corner to on a side street onto the highway onto the divided highway I was on and um, we I collided with the, the front fender um, at that intersection he was making a right on red and um, I as I recall, I went down on the ground, um, and um, I ended up in the in the part way into the street or into the street into the gutter, and um, the second set of wheels ran over my left leg. Um, it, it it happened at the time I did not know, but the wheel um, snapped my uh, femur. And uh, created a compound fracture, um, severing my femoral artery, and um, I did not know that. I just felt a little snap and a white flat, a flash, and I decided to, I'd better get out of the way of the rest of the trailer. Um, he hadn't stopped, and um, I pulled myself up onto the sidewalk, and uh, I lay there, and uh, people were pounding on it on the on the truck to stop and um, people were calling 911 and they kept saying 911 is busy. Um, one of those persons was uh, um, an off-duty EMT and um, he proceeded to call in a helicopter, medevac. Um, there was an off-duty police officer across the street um, who came to the scene um, I was wearing a helmet, luckily, and uh, I, I lifted my head up and to see what was going on, and I noticed a large quantity of blood on my left side. Um, I was bleeding out, um, and I thought for my first thought was to draw some of my artwork in the blood, um, and then I realized that's a lot of blood, um, and I looked, tilted my head up, and I saw my shorts were bloody, and I stuck my fingers jam my fingers into the wound um, I realized that it was a lot of blood and being an Eagle Scout um, when I was younger um, I knew to stop the blood um, a few moments later the EMT showed up and uh, there was two of them by this time all I could hear was audio uh, I couldn't he- I could hear people talking I couldn't see anything um, couldn't feel anything all my senses were going and um the first emt said holy fuck he's a mess and the other guy said yeah but he's holding himself um they proceeded to work on me um and there's bits and pieces that are kind of fuzzy um something to the fact that they he said that uh we got to go now we got to do this now and um so they put me on the backboard and the stretcher and it wasn't until probably several years later that I realized that between that moment and going to the ambulance, um, I saw the side of the stretcher 
I wasn't seeing the sky and I was able to see. And um, this image came from above and away from the stretcher. So I was out of my body at that point and uh, I was watching them wheel me to the ambulance. Um, I came back into the, my body when they started putting me into the ambulance and uh, they asked me a lot of questions, asked me my name. And in our family, we, people ask our name, we'd automatically spell the last name because it's, you know, it's kind of difficult and it's, it's kind of a rare name. Um, the EMT said he's babbling and, uh, and that's when I experienced the white light and uh, I coded. Uh, his name was Junior and he was an EMT from um, Sarasota Station, I believe two, or maybe one. And um, he was given CPR compressions while the ambulance was driving to the helicopter that was called in. Um, from that moment, I had experienced the white light and that went away. I heard nothing, I felt nothing. I, it was just nothing. Um, it was a wonderful experience, most probably the most wonderful experience I've ever experienced in my entire life, period. And um, it was indescribable. Um, it just felt to this overwhelming calmness and at peace. And um, I woke up to screaming um, nine hours later in the ICU. Um, my femoral already was severed. Um, they put a Gore-Tex graph in. Um, my femur, my uh, tib fib was fractured. I had a bunch of fractures. Um, I was black and blue all over, and um, my lungs, both my lungs were collapsed from the CPR. I had coded four or five times between in route of chopper and um, surgery. I was in surgery for four and a half hours. They pumped 40 units through me. And my sister, the doctor, said right around 40 units, they just stop working on you. Um, units of blood? Units of blood. Oh, wow. Yeah, units of blood, which is, um, you know, when you go give blood, one or, you get one or two units. I went through 40 of those. And um, my sister was over, over my head, and um, I was on a ventilator. I was down to 20% oxygen. Both my lungs were collapsed. Um, and um, I was on a feeding tube and uh, that was at nine o'clock at night and um, she was screaming at me, you know, you're okay, you're in the ICU, the worst is over. Um, and then, uh, and then about two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, my sister, my other sister, and my dad had drove from um, Boca, which is across the state, four hours, and they drove in. Is that uh, Boca Raton? Boca Raton, yeah, Florida. Um, from Miss, we were on the Gulf side. We were. They had fl airlifted me to Saint Petersburg, Florida, Bayfront Hospital, and so it was. It was about a four-hour drive. Um, and they, they came in the ICU, and that's that is pretty much all I can remember from that. They didn't have me on morphine because my heart rate, my blood pressure was extremely low. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember a lot of the accident and um, everything past that. Um, mainly, if it wasn't for that, um, I wouldn't be here. Um, it's... Uh, and then I proceeded to spend 10 days in the ICU um, and my sisters took um, notes and wrote a journal about it. Um, and within that time, a lot of things happened. Um, there was a lot of screaming, especially at night. Um, other people would come in in the middle of the night and um, out of the 18 people on that wing, um, I was one of the only two people that were conscious. Um, a lot of those people never made the morning. They were dead by morning. Um, the screaming was over, and I knew that they were gone. Um, 
So the guy to my right of me, he never came. Uh, he, he died second day or third day. The guy to my left, he never came out of a coma. None of a few other people died along the way. And um, it's, I associate screaming and children screaming and, um, and, and loud noises from people. Um, not really abrasive or not really um, obtrusive. I, I consider that as long as you're screaming uh, or crying, you got some life in you. Um, it's the silence that was deafening in the morning. Um, I did uh, did experience a few things um, during those 10 days. I experienced um, visions of one procession of, uh, of um, firefighters, probably from the 17, 1800s. And there was a long profession. Uh, I wasn't a hallucination. It was more like a vision, a parade of, of just firefighters walking past me like procession, um, I guess to honor me or give tribute or something or pay my respects. Um, and there were hundreds of them that just filed past me. Um, I saw my mother who had passed away a year and two weeks before that at the foot of my bed with her, my aunt who had died in the mid eighties or late eighties. Um, they came to me as a vision. Um, a lot of priests came up to me and prayed over me. Um, that first night I wasn't expected to, I, I was told later I wasn't expected to make it through the night. Um, I was just so messed up, um, but I did, and um, then they transferred me, and I spent two months in the hospital, and um, I spent a total of four and a half months in Florida. Um, the rehab was, most of it was, part of it was physical, I had to learn how to walk again, um, and uh, I had therapy for the trauma and PTSD. Um, you know, I came back here probably, it was the day, April 14th. So I left right before Christmas and I came back April 14th. Um, in that time I've had over almost, pro I, I've had 10 therapists working on my trauma and, uh, PTSD. Um, like I said before, I... I'm part of the Art Ability um, art show every year in um, the fall um, for disabled artists. Um, down in Florida, I called my boss and I said, I'm never coming back to work. Um, this is too big. Um, you can fill my position. Um, I got a little bit of a cash settlement from the whole thing. All that money has been gone, you know, was gone just a couple of years later. and wasn't, you know, wasn't hitting the lottery or anything. Um, and um, I came back here. I got rid of my house and roommate. And um, I had my own house. So I got rid of him. And um, that summer I spent uh, most of my time in bed. And then um, towards the end of the summer, I, I painted a mural down the street um, with my characters and the big text that says, Be kind. And my buddy artist friend, um, Jeffrey Partridge did the lettering and um, two girls helped me as well. Um, Jeffrey was in the news last, I think it was last year. He went missing and um, they found him about four, probably five months later. I think he was in the school call. He had de severe depression. He committed suicide. One of the two girls committed suicide. So there's only two of the four people left that did the mural. The mural was done um, on a big wall. It's 50 feet long. It's pecan as a as a tribute and a, as a way to say thank you to my neighborhood um, for helping me mow my lawn and go get groceries and just be neighbors. And... Um, so um, we did that, and um, we proceeded to be a full-time artist after that. Um, 
I'd sell my work through Facebook and um, I still live with the trauma today. It's not nearly as severe, it's not nearly as bad. Um, in 2011, I got a beautiful um, pit bull mix, Noel. Um, she's three legged. She was found in Chester in the middle of the road, um, dark, rainy night. Um, she had a leg that was broken in three places. And um, the man scooped her up, brought her in to rescue, and uh, she was transferred to Media SPCA, where the, the vet there couldn't save the leg. It was just, it was just awful. And um, she amputated, so she's now a three legged pit. And she came home. Um, the day it was the day after Christmas and um, in 2011 and I've had her since and uh, she's my quote personal therapy dog um, she helps me sleep she helped me cope through a lot of that um, we healed each other I got her with a lot of stitches and staples still um I learned a lot of things along the way. I, I wrote a children's book. Um, it took me five years to write my, my book about my story, and my situation, my art, my accident. Um, it was one breath at a time. And the title it portrays to um, one night in particular in the ICU where um, there was um, one really good nurse and... Uh, two new nurses and two orderlies. In that ICU unit, usually one nurse got two patients. That night, um, that one nurse had to handle 18 of us with two new nurses. Um, and um, I would pretty much just listen to the screaming. There was a motorcycle guy came in that night and she came. the nurse came by and just stand by me and told me that He's not going to make it, you know. We had they had him jacked up on morphine, and they couldn't give him any more. And he was screaming, and he, he said, "She's not going to make. He's not going to make the night." And that's one of the many people that died. And in the morning, it was quiet. By morning, I I would breathe. I would do a meditation. Um, for that whole night, I would breathe in here and exhale now. And I was on a vent, so it's about all I could do was breathe. So I breathe in here, exhale now, and, and uh, I did that when I was awake to try to get myself back to sleep. Um, so that's the title of the book. That's how that came about. Um, the book covers um, my sister's journals that they wrote while I was in the ICU. I've never read it, and I, and I don't intend to. I, I cut out all the bits that they important numbers and, and, not, and stuff like that but it's actually scanned into the book in their own handwriting and um, after the 10 days I started in my own journal um, in a notebook and uh, I did a bunch of drawings and um, that became the book uh, it was quite traumatic to write that it took five years and you know it's I, for the most part I, I wrote it five minutes at a time I opened up my laptop and wrote for five minutes a day and then, and then shot it. Um, and along came uh, one of my good friends. She was a, a proofreader, so she proofread it. Um, it's got a lot of ups and downs. It makes people laugh. It makes people cry. Um, and then it goes to one year later, and it has some anecdotes and things that I cope with um, my situation um, I do a lot of artwork um, I write I do uh, poetry and writing and um, stuff just to try to um, cope the writing and the artwork um, really does um, help me through the day and um, you know it's been a long hard road sometimes but um, it's gone a whole lot easier um for the past three years, uh, I've had my girlfriend live here, and um, we're engaged to be married, but it's not going to happen for another 12, 14 years. Um, she was married before, um, so she wants to, um, her deceased husband 
she wants to co um, collect on his social security mm. and so she can't do that if she gets married again um, so we're kind of committed to we are committed to each other um, she's been through enough I've been through enough um, and we have another rescue dog and um, she was um, my girlfriend actually drove down many years ago to pick her up from here in Pennsylvania and drove all the way down to um, North Carolina in the middle of the night and, and saved Gypsy, the, the black lab, to, uh, she was going to be put down that day. And she drove all the way down there just to, to rescue her from being put down um, and drove her back here. And we have two rescue kitties. Um, and uh, so her house is, you know, rescued and healing. And um, there's a lot of artwork. Um, and, um, you know, um, I learned a few things in the hospital. I learned that we all matter. We're all important, no matter what we do. That cleaning lady that came in the ICU, um, she came in after a few day, you know, um, every day to clean my place. And I would say hello to her and thank her. And, um, you know, a few, only a few, me and one other patient was a conscious. So she, it, she would come in and just talk to me and say hi. Um, and uh, I learned the cleaning staff was very important. I learned every, everybody in the hospital, no matter what their job was there to take me home, to so get me home. Um, that was their job. And um, they did a phenomenal job. Um, I you know, I, I send them st st thank yous and um, some gifts sometimes during Christmas holiday um, to do that. Um, you know, uh, I show my work mostly on Facebook now. Um, David Gerbs at Facebook and um, and I also have Be Kind Buttons Facebook page. Uh, I started that in 2016, the Be Kind Buttons. Um, and I go to a lot of schools. I've gone to high schools and elementary schools, and I've done um, projects and workshops with them at the school. Um, I've done over almost, almost 12,000 Be Kind Buttons. And a lot of those are for uh, schools and um, organizations all around the country. Um, so we have uh, a couple other taglines that we use in our work is you are loved, be kind, um, you matter, um, share. And a lot of those were, um, I learned in the hospital and down in Florida. Um, Do you feel like your uh, traumatic experiences made you stronger as a person? Um, I truly feel like I, I, it's a new life in the same body. Um, there's time, yeah, it, it has changed me completely. Um, my brother who up to that, I was, it happened when I was 39 and up to that point, uh, a relationship between my older brother and me were, um, estranged. We didn't talk, we didn't touch. And, um, that changed dramatically. Now we're pretty much best buds. And, um, he said it would have been a shame if, if you died. And, um, so that situation changed. Um, there's some things I, you know, I wish it, you know, I don't sleep so well. Um, I, I, you know, I have night sweats and, uh, I wake up very often through the night and, um, so some things are good and some things aren't so good. Um, I learned who my friends are. When I came back, um, there's friends I had for years that just don't talk to me anymore. And, um, that's okay. You know, I was told that would happen, and um, I got new friends. They just, you know, new friends showed up, and um, and I learned who my family was too. You know, and um, who I can rely on. They rely on me, so yeah, a lot of things have changed. You know, it's not always the best. You know, like I always say, it's you know life turns on a dime. You never know what's going to happen next. Some have, some may be good and some not so good. Um, but you just have to. Um, I have to accept the situation where I am now and and what what I've done and 
you know, uh, I had to work on a lot of depression. Um, probably about three or four years ago, I had to ex accept the fact that I didn't want to be here anymore. And I had thought that since I came back from Florida, um, and I had to work with a few doctors to work on that. Um, you know, um, that's very common with PTSD. I've had, I have about 25 friends of mine who are artists who are neighbors who commit suicide. Um, well, you know, a couple of which are start help me with that mural. So, um, I take that very seriously and I got help. Um, and I've seen along the way, you know, the suicide. Um, so if that's the case, um, the only thing I could do is get help. Um, or if you know somebody that, you know, is not so right, you know, maybe you should help them out. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good and a lot of not so good, but for the most part, I'm a, try to be as grateful as I possibly can and, and, um, and count my blessings. Um, so that's pretty much the whole story. Um, can't think of much more to say. Um, well, I think you have yeah. a fascinating story. Yeah. It's 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 rough and it's um it's pretty raw. It's you know um, there's a lot of you know it's if if the if the book is read the it, the book is an audio and then also a, a PDF online. Um, so uh, yeah, if anybody wants to read the book, um, I'm very glad to send them a copy. Mm -hmm. So and it's actually there is the paperback version is up on Amazon.